Hello, my name is Michael Dwan Herrick. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach in private practice in London in the UK. I have over 40 years of experience in the field, including 10 years where I was a teacher for students working toward qualification as psychotherapists in the UK. Of those 10 years, five of them I spent teaching a course titled Diversity to prepare students to handle diversity in their practices. So I have some experience and some immersion in these ideas. Under the general title of Questioning Woke Psychotherapy, the title of this video is Politics in Psychotherapy. As I've prepared this, it became fairly large and I've decided to break it into two parts so that it's more manageable to watch and it won't be too long. In this first part, what I want to do is provide a context for exploring politics and psychotherapy. And that context will be a general sweeping view of the history of development of ideas in psychotherapy from the beginning, starting with Freud and, and moving toward the present. The history of those ideas then I want to situate within a conceptual framework of four fundamental perspectives. And if you've seen my other videos, you've heard me talk about the four quadrants of integral theory. So I'm, I'm going to use that to frame the variety of ideas that have developed over time for psychotherapy. And don't worry, if you, if you haven't heard of this before, I'm going to put up a graphic and it, it'll be clear as we move forward. My general intention for this whole series is really twofold. On the one hand, I do intend to and have offered criticism of woke psychotherapy as informed by critical social justice theory. But I also want to recognize its good intentions and where its concerns are valid and further to offer an alternative, what I believe is a, a better way to address those concerns than the way it proposes. And that's what the second in this two-part mini-series under the title of Questioning Woke Psychotherapy will be after I provide the context historically and conceptually for the field, I want to then launch into talking about how to address political issues within the consulting room in a way that I think makes use of the rich wisdom and understanding that we've gotten over a over hundred years in the field and keeps our eye on the ball of working with clients and their problems and their needs and not getting hijacked by an ambition to practice social justice activism. Before I launch into a description of the history of ideas within the field of psychotherapy, I want to make a brief comment, and that's that this is a very big story. It's complicated. It's nuanced. There's all kinds of angles on it. What I'm able to do in this brief time is only make generalizations. And you may find that there are some exceptions to the rule of what I'm saying. That's fine. I'm just wanting to, to give a sense of the sweep of ideas over time. Although what we have come to call psychotherapy has ancient roots in similar kinds of human help, uh, going back, way back, and probably includes shamanic traditions. What we call psychotherapy can be traced back pretty much to Freud's development of his psychoanalytic model and around the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. In this beginning, the focus was really on the intrapsychic process going on for the individual the unconscious mind of the individual and bringing that to consciousness. The notion that concern with political issues in the broader world uh, could be a part of that conversation it seemed to be inappropriate during that, that phase of, of psychotherapy. And often therapists would avoid it and, and think it just wasn't suitable material for the enterprise of 
of psychoanalysis. So I think I'll put the graphic up now and uh, you'll see these four quadrants. <clears throat> the mind, the body, relationships and environment. And these are the upper left is the interior of the individual, upper right is the exterior of the individual, the lower left is the interior of the collective, collective the lower the lower left is the interior of the collective, the lower right is the exterior of the collective. And so what I want to do, I'll put it up and then I'll have everything included in it and then I'll talk th through each one. And you'll see for um, psychoanalytic thought, we can place that up in the upper left quadrant. That's the perspective that it favored, that it focused on. And we'll see with the addition of more and more ideas to the field, the other quadrants begin to be filled out a bit. Also, as we go through each of the bodies of ideas that I'm going to mention, I want to point out that there have been some ardent or even zealous proponents of those ideas that have wanted to claim that their chosen perspective is the best the most important or the only really useful lens through which to look at people in, in the endeavor to provide psychotherapy. Not everybody who would adopt these different ideas would be what I'd call a, a quadrant absolutist or a quadrant reductionist, but I, I want to point out that this has often happened along the way. And that's something that I'll be, I'll be challenging along the way as well. Somewhere around mid 20th century, with the development of ideas uh, within systems theory, as first put forward by Ludwig von Bertalanffy, family therapy came to be. It came to be that individuals were seen not as just atomistic entities, but as nodes in a system. And the family system was the system in which our development uh, carried on. So family therapy came along and took a view that the individual was not so much the focus of attention. It wasn't the lens or the perspective that we look through. It was the system around the person. And again, not, not all family therapists were quadrant reductionists about this, but there there was some of that where, you know, you really couldn't understand an individual uh, in their own individual mind. What you needed to do was work with the family to do any meaningful work. So you can see that I've situated family therapy in the bottom left quadrant because that was its and is its primary focus. Also in mid 20th century, in the 50s and 60s, humanistic and existential psychotherapy and psychology were developed and added to the views of how to work with people. They also could be characterized pretty much in the upper left hand quadrant or the interior of the individual, but they took a different view from a psychoanalytic uh, approach and had a more kind of person-centered, if you will, approach and didn't focus so much on diagnosing people and uh, shoehorning them <laughs> into some uh, idea of what they, sh they needed to do to get better, but took their lead. So an important development in the field, but still oriented by and large in the upper left. Another important contribution and development within the field of psychotherapy was the introduction of cognitive behavioral forms of therapy in the 60s, first presented by Aaron Beck. And this focuses on the kind of way of thinking, beliefs and uh, mental models that a person has, along with the behaviors that it seems to drive and that therapy could address both of these. An important contribution, which has had many offshoots and many different ways of being practiced and understood, but I would see it as focusing primarily on the upper left and the upper right, and 
by body, we can also include behavior because that's what the body does. The body is what behaves. Another important development that occurred in the latter part of the 20th century is something called the biopsychosocial model. And this was put forward first by George Ingle. And it said that in order to really understand people and work with them effectively, we had to understand them biologically, in terms of body, uh, psychologically, in terms of mind, and socially, in terms of relationships. Uh, I think this was an important contribution to the field. And when I started my work in 1980 in a psychiatric hospital, and I became aware of this model, it immediately made sense to me, and I gravitated toward it. Another development that was in the air around the same time, maybe even a little before, was the medical model, biomedical model for mental health. And with advances in neuroscience and brain studies and pharmacology, we had the, the time when mental illnesses were considered to be brain diseases. So there was a... <laughs> My experience was holding this uh, biopsychosocial model in my mind while working in a hospital that was increasingly uh, considering patients in terms of their, their brain chemistry and drugging them. So two things I want to say just about the biopsychosocial model and the medical model. My sense of the biopsycho biopsychosocial model is that it Take, it takes the perspective of three of the quadrants. The bottom right quadrant, the exterior of the collective, institutional life, and broader society, I don't think it took quite as keen a view of. It, it left, left some questions unanswered there. The medical model, though, really hunkered down on the upper right-hand quadrant and really tried to dominate all understanding of mental health and mental illness. With the civil rights movements of the 60s and the 70s in terms of racial equality, feminism, women's rights, and gay rights, and then in the 80s we had the introduction of the idea of intersectionality by Kimberly Crenshaw. We also saw the rise of cultural psychology and the idea of multiculturalism really take hold. And these began to percolate in the environment and find their way into psychotherapy. It's been about 30 years now since I first read this book, but I think this book had its own impact on, on the field. Um, this, the title is, We've Had 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. And this was by Jungian psychologist James Hillman and Michael Ventura. And they made a case for the fact that all of the focus on the individual and in psychotherapy didn't seem to have made a difference in our cultural condition, in our social condition. And they, I think, laid some groundwork for nodding toward, yes, maybe talking about politics and therapy is uh, a good idea. Maybe, maybe that shouldn't be taboo. And then in the 90s, although it has a long history in terms of its influence on psychotherapy, it was more in the 90s that critical social justice began to inform therapy and began to really put a spotlight on issues in the, the lower right and the lower left quadrant and saw that people's individual problems are often tied up in their condition, their social position in our society, and brought some focus there. I have lost track of how many different forms of psychotherapy there are. There are hundreds, and obviously I can't begin to address all of them. So I've just mentioned the ones that seem most significant to me. But there are a couple more that I, I want to add here because they have been pretty influential, uh, especially 
in the 21st century, I think, although they have roots going back further. Um, <clears throat> one is relational therapy, which really focuses on the relationship between the therapist and the client. Now, this has always been considered to be important, but there's a, a, a way that relational therapy has developed this further and really honed in on it. The other is body-oriented psychotherapies. And again, these have earlier roots, but they've continued on and are very informative for many psychotherapists these days. So in terms of relational therapy, you might guess, I would situate that in the bottom left-hand corner. In terms of body-oriented psychotherapy, I would put it in the upper right. Now, both of them also recognize the mind of, of the client. So it's, it's not apart from that, but <clears throat> the emphasis is on uh, the body or on the relationship. Again, these are important and valuable contributions to the field and something that I believe all therapists should be familiar with to some degree. And finally, one more that I just personally want to include because I think it's intriguing to me and I've uh, been interested in it for a long time, and that's eco-psychology. So there's a, a branch in the field that really looks at human beings' relationship, particularly with the natural environment and how being dissociated from the natural environment can not be good for our mental health, how restoring connection with the natural environment can be good for our mental health. So eco-psychology, <clears throat> and I would put that in the lower right-hand quadrant. Again, it's connected to you know, the upper two quadrants indirectly, the psychological and the physical well-being of people, but it wants to focus on the environment. So while I put it in the, while I put eco-psychology in the lower right-hand quadrant, I, I do want to point out that it really is mostly concerned seems with the natural environment. It's not concerned with so much with the social environment, the institutional environment that people live within. That, I think, is the special interest of woke psychotherapy and critical social justice. Now, I hope that I've been able to provide a historical sense of the development and contribution of ideas to the field of psychotherapy from various places and how they fit in a map or in a framework of four basic uh, perspectives that each one offers a lens to see people and to inform psychotherapeutic work with that understanding. I also hope that I've shown that in the bottom right hand quadrant there hasn't been quite as much over time until now uh, a full on exploration of that and then taking it, taking it seriously, which I believe that woke psychotherapy informed by critical social justice does. But again, like with any of the other perspectives, when it becomes a quadrant absolutism or reductionism, or it crowds out or dismisses or forgets about the other perspectives, then I think it's running into trouble. And what I want to do in the next video is begin to talk about how we can have conversations about political issues in the consulting room with clients. When is that appropriate? How can that be done? And especially, how can that be done in a way that doesn't forget all of the wisdom and contributions and understanding that this field is richly endowed with over time. How do we manage to not become zealous political activists who lose track of the root purpose for doing psychotherapy, which is to serve the well-being of the client? How do we not lose track of that by promoting an ideology of social activism? So please join me in the next video to hear, hear more about that. Again, what I've done in this video is create a context 
in which what I have to say next hopefully will will make more sense. Thanks for staying with me to the end of this video. If you liked it, please give me a like, subscribe to my channel, share this with a friend or somebody that you think might be interested, and leave me a comment. I'm very curious. I haven't been getting many comments, so I'd really like it. Just leave me any kind of comment. You like it, you don't like it, you think I missed something, something you'd like me to talk about in the future under this uh, title of Questioning Woke Psychotherapy. Until next time, be well, take care, bye-bye.